This is The Art of Startup War, and I am your sensei, Brian McMahon. Now, in season one and two, I got inside the minds of startup investors. In season three, I brought in entrepreneurs to share their startup journey. Here, in season four, we combine both so you can hear investors critique the investment value proposition of individual companies. You're going to hear how investors make decisions to invest in startups, what makes a great entrepreneur, and how billion-dollar companies are built. So tune in every Tuesday, 10 a.m., on all the major platforms. You can empower your tribe by sharing the podcast. And remember to subscribe, rate, review, and leave us a comment. Good morning. It's Brian. It is Tuesday. It is another wonderful day in the fridge in Santa Monica. I've got another fantastic entrepreneur. And we are going to talk not just about how her business is going to grow, but how her business is going to help entrepreneurs grow. Mona, you flew down from San Francisco. What can I say? You're a, you're a contender. You turn up. And actually, that my, this is my biggest thing. For the whole year this year, my biggest, biggest, biggest thing has been the folks who turn up yeah, we can be unlucky and we can turn up for stuff which wasn't worth their while. But the chances are that if we turn up enough times for the right things, then we'll be a hell of a lot luckier than other people. So you came down, you came down to the podcast, and we're Absolutely. happy to have you here. Thank you. It's great to be here. Now, your mission is similar to mine, which yes. is a beautiful thing. You want to help entrepreneurs. You want to help yeah. them become more successful. And you want to make sure that the world is a better place where creativity flourishes and entrepreneurs become more successful. Absolutely. Talk to me a little bit about how you are helping them do that. Yeah. So we want to get the word out. Um, every entrepreneurial company, this is my fourth startup. Okay. I've had two prior exits. I had a great lesson. It's hard. I've been there in the trenches with you guys. And it's a 90% failure rate industry. And it's trial and error. You know, the way we fundraise and stuff, it's practically still like Christopher Columbus and Queen Isabella still. Correct. It's very antiquated, opaque, <laughs> fragmented <Isabella>. industry. <laughs> we haven't had a Queen Isabella reference in a I long know, time. I know, but it's practically like that it's still, awesome isn't it? true. It really is. <laughs> so we need to change this. So I've been in this industry three decades. I helped take four companies public. I've raised funds, and I helped one of my wow. previous startups help start the private markets, which started the unicorn investing trend. And now I'm here to bring consumers in, back in, really. So back when I did my four IPOs over 10 years in the 90s, half my shareholder base were consumers. Now it's zero in private companies. It's zero consumers in IPOs. They've really been cut out. And we've seen since... Really? The, oh, yeah, since the late so 90s. I look, yep. I've always seen American market as a little bit of a closed shop market. What I never realized that it was open in the past. Yep. I always just imagined it was always a closed shop. Right. Well, see, you're much younger than I am. So. <laughs> oh, I love that you say that. <laughs> I know. You know, you can come into this podcast studio anytime because you're about the only, as I, as I put on my glasses at like five in the evening, I'm like, I can't see that anymore because I'm so old, but I'm not today. No, it's true. There's really been an evolution in the industry. So right. I came out, um, I would say, in entrepreneurship in about 89. And between 91 and 2000, I did my four IPOs. So I worked very closely with the number one venture firm um, at the time with one of the four big banks that did all the IPOs with the number one mutual fund who was the biggest buyer of IPOs. Wow. And um, back in the day during the 90s when the economy was booming, right, um, half of the shareholder base approximately was retail shareholders or the consumer shareholders. Uh -huh. We used to have stockbrokers. You've probably heard of the term. They don't exist anymore. Oh, I know stockbrokers. But they don't I'm exist. probably older than you think. <laughs> I, I, I know stockbrokers. All of us have heard of it. Yeah, but they really don't exist anymore. So the retail, so what used to happen, the venture industry was built on a model of seven-year funds. You would invest over three years, grow the company, and you'd exit in three to five years. Right. Now, and the exit was usually IPO and or M&A, but yeah. IPO was the primary model. Yeah. It was a, the brass ring. IPO being initial public offering. Initial public offering. Mm -hmm. Exactly, becoming public. And 90% of all job growth happened after an IPO also. So it was really important to get those companies public, which is the cheapest form of capital yep. at the time. And the markets used to work. There was an infrastructure. And then many things changed. There was you know, really a perfect storm of about eight, nine factors. And there was a seismic shift. Stockbrokers disappeared. 
um, the financial analysts disappeared. Hedge funds came in and took over deals. Deals suddenly became very, very large. The big banks bought the smaller boutique banks. There were four that did most of the IPOs. Now the big banks came in. They were serving their hedge fund clients. And in the process of all of this, um, the internet bubble happened because all the deals went very, very, very large. Mm -hmm. And the prices became large to fit the big banks and the big hedge funds, and it was unsustainable, and it crashed. It wasn't right. just a matter of too many companies, not high quality. That's yep. kind of how we understood it. I remember. So 10 years later, you know, in 2007, almost 10 years later, we still weren't having IPOs. And a lot of these funds that were raised in 99 and 2000 at the height of the market – uh, they were expiring and there were no exits and it was going to be a bloodbath in Silicon Valley. So that's when I was asked to come in and help fix the IPO crisis. We studied this, understood it, and then created the first private market platform. How interesting. Which brought, and Second Market bought my company. So you probably heard of Second Market and they sold a lot of Facebook shares and we saw what happened to Facebook after, at their IPO. And um, but since then, the 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 unicorn trend has gotten to be known of bringing public investors into private companies. Yeah. Right. That grew and it was too big and too good and too strong a trend for, you know, to be killed, just like Facebook was too strong a company to be mm -hmm. killed with a bad IPO. They continued to grow and survive. And then now I believe the other half of the market um, that's been cut out for 20 years, the consumer investors, it's time for them to come back because there are zero in, um, are we doing about equity crowdfunding and the Jobs Act no, and all those things? No, that was that was because what there, there are I'm yes. funny, I was with Howard Marks from Start Engine this morning. Oh, and cool. And you've got WeFunder, and right. you've got like a bunch of other things going on. Right. We do. And that was the SEC's way of trying to bring them in. This is actually, a, thank you for mentioning this, it's a top priority of the SEC. And uh, Jay Clayton, the SEC chairman, was on Bloomberg TV recently and David Rubenstein's show. He's the founder and CEO of Carlyle Group, and he mm -hmm. has this wonderful interview show. And they were talking about how it's a top priority of the SEC to bring the Main Street investor or the consumer investor back into illiquid securities. Because we know most of the profits are made in private companies. And... Retail customers, the unaccredited investors, cannot really invest outside of crowdfunding, which has its benefits, but many limitations. And they also can't invest in IPOs. So what I'm trying to do is create new ways to do this. But the first step is building a really strong, transparent information network. Really what, what Radivision is, is the new ESPN for entrepreneurship. That's my current company. And so right now all we have is Shark Tank. We have this fabulous show, 11 seasons. It's getting bigger, not smaller, the opposite of all other shows in television. All of the sharks are now major stars. And we know that people watch the show and they transact. So it's a fabulous PR and advertising vehicle for companies. Yeah, it's funny. We had uh, Kevin Harrington in here many <laughs> times in the past, one of the original Shark Tank, the He's original great. Sharks, right? Yep. And Robert Hershevek is at dinner. They're all, Mark Cuban wrote to us last week. They're very, very engaged. And Shark Tank has been really good to them. So is Shark Tank better for the sharks or is it better for the companies who go on? I think it's great for both. I mean, there's a documented Shark Tank effect. You can Google it. There's several articles now and lots of data. And literally millions of dollars of products are sold overnight. And companies have said eight to nine million downloads of their app has happened. All of the sharks are, you know, major brands in themselves now and have major activities even outside the show. And so that's what my goal is with Radivision is to create this huge effect. So not just one show, but an entire digital TV network that and it's not just a TV network it's integrated with a social network so we have built like a Netflix like video streaming network we have uh, Radivision Originals we aggregate other people's content like your great podcast we already put it into our um, podcast Whoa. Carousel, so more people can find you because I didn't Fantastic. I wasn't even aware and when I listened to it I was so impressed and people all over the world want to know this thank you there are so many people in 
you know, areas of the world where they're in first generation entrepreneurial ecosystem and half or more of their college graduates can't find jobs in corporations. You know, they need to become entrepreneurs and they don't know how to do it. And it's trial and error, but they don't have mentors. They don't have angel networks and they can be listening to your podcast and learning and being inspired and finding other resources. So that's our goal is to aggregate everybody's content, get people to know you, you know, you're a celebrity to us, but we want you to be a celebrity to the whole world in the same way that Shark Tank made all their people celebrities. And then how would you get the users to come on? Because I'm with you mm-hmm. on Shark Tank. I think we've had about three or four companies okay. uh, we've had go on Shark Tank and they've all had exactly that effect. I mean, so many people watch it. We know actually it's interesting. The effect is so strong that the biggest challenge becomes that the companies are not strong <laughs> enough to deal with the demand right. that comes from being on the show, right? It's that right. powerful. But how do you create an mm-hmm. audience base that powerful to attract the great entrepreneurs in the first place? Right. So we tested a prototype about two years ago um, in, se- in May of 17. And we just, you know, $3,000 of Facebook ads. We had over a million video views for our nine pilots we created for two shows. Wow. Um, the short format was three minutes seven-minute shows, and we had over 100,000 monthly unique visitors from Facebook come to our website to check out more, and it it went viral, and you can see it on our Facebook page. There's a lot of people's names, you know, so people put their friends' names so that they would be tagged. So I I intuited that not only is entrepreneurship the biggest trend on the planet right Mm -hmm. now, but it's very disorganized. You Google the word entrepreneurship, there's 150 million hits. Where do you go? Where is it? But it's also not very consumer friendly. It's a B2B business. Most of the media is very B2B. It's Mm -hmm. sophisticated. It Mm -hmm. takes time to get there. And I wanted to um, create content that not only is for entrepreneurs, you know, and budding entrepreneurs, but also for people to simply be inspired by entrepreneurs. That's why I got into this business 30 years ago. I was so inspired by the passion and the energy and, you know, the willingness to do the impossible and believe that anything can happen. You know, that's the way I was. And that's, you know, and I was attracted to my people. And I think there'll be a lot of people who may be watching the Kardashians or movie stars or other influencers who simply want to be inspired and are going to watch entrepreneurs and in the process may become engaged, may learn how to invest part of their retirement investment in funds or, you know, be able to benefit from this equity economy, buy the products and just have fun. So the objective is to help more people invest, right? Because the Jobs Act kind of broke that door down a tiny bit. It did. And allowed people to get into it. Now, it's still yep. such a new industry that it hasn't quite happened like a flood that we hoped. Yeah. But it's beginning to. Yeah, it's hard. I've looked at crowdfunding. I studied it. It's hard because you have to go out and market it yourself. So for 10 years in the 90s, my job was uh, director of investor relations or vice president of corporate development for four different companies. Mm-hmm. Spent a couple of years years with each, help them go public and then trade their stocks. So my job was to market these companies. Um, And I did both the financial marketing, the IR, investor relations, and the PR and the public relations. I'd get one good story and the stock would go crazy. Right. Um, You know, so what, what I'm really focused on here is not on the financial part, it's simply the PR part, getting the word out, telling the inspiring stories of these great entrepreneurs that you see every day, doing the impossible, making really cool things, changing the world. And People will watch that for fun, for discovery, new products, all of that. On top of that, we'll be built a whole other level for the financial part. Because what we can do once we have a large audience is we can aggregate that. The trouble with crowdfunding is you have to go out there as a company and you have to do most of the sales and marketing yourself, I think. I mean, some of the... the, the platforms are good. They have a few hundred thousand users or whatever, but you still have to do a lot of that sales and marketing, and it's hard. Fundraising is hard, um, and getting the word out is hard. And, and then, the ch- it, and the challenge is, of course, that the platform don't want to put you on the top if you haven't raised any money, and it's hard that's to true. raise money, right? Unless folks can see you, right? And they usually want just to. It's they, a bit like trying they, to. They date. want to add on to your raise. Yeah, they're it, not going to do the it, whole raise for you. It's a bit you. like feeling nervous about going out to date because you don't <laughs> want to go into a bar while you're standing on your own. But you're not right. going to meet anyone if you don't go if out. If you're hiding, right? And you're, if you're yeah. hiding away, yeah, right? If you're so, sitting at home. So the idea is phenomenal, but the the engagement is challenging. 
the execution is hard and, and it's one on one. So for the investor, they're also getting full exposure, right? Because they're investing in one company. There's a 90% failure rate. What's your chance of getting into that one? And usually the strongest companies are picked up by Peter Thiel or Andreessen right. Horowitz. Or they're probably not going to be crowdfunding just yet, although it's getting more and more. There's so many good companies that have trouble raising because there's thousands of companies now. And the competition alone is now becoming a yeah. negative effect. And, and actually, Robert Hershevik and Neil Patel just put together a platform angels and <laughs> I was going to say demons but I'm sure it's <laughs> angels and entrepreneurs or something <laughs> um, but they just put together that platform selling the you know the the luxury lifestyle of oh. being able to invest um, but, uh, and, oh, I like and there are certain things certain things that disturb me a little bit about how they portray it because it is very Tony Robbinsy and mm -hmm. how you can be a millionaire overnight but there's also certain things I really like about it such as if we look at many of the very wealthy people in the United States from the Vanderbilts to the JP Morgans all the way through many of those have made their money through backing an early stage investor an early stage entrepreneur oh interesting all, all the way okay. back to the Wright brothers mm -hmm. Where if you backed the Wright brothers, you probably would have done pretty good, right? That's mm -hmm. a patent I would like, mm -hmm. considering it's what everybody uses these days. So backing an entrepreneur is definitely a phenomenal way forward. And I, I really like what you say about as an entrepreneur, as a investor, be careful. Because don't just invest in one company because the chances of being successful is virtually zero. You need to invest. I think Pasadena Angels put it at 23 companies to give yourself right. the best chance to actually being able to get a reasonable return back on your money. Right. Or if they could come in as an LP, for example, to a future expert dojo fund and you are providing alpha management. So you have expertise and the ability to see hundreds or thousands of companies. You are being selective over the companies you choose. You are also giving them extra support. And then if they're able to come in as an LP, say you aggregate enough people that it can be meaningful to you and then you're helping them. Um, invest, that actually allows them diversification, it allows them alpha, and it supports you to do what you love more as well. And it's very true. And, yeah. and probably in our initial fund, we have it ourselves. So we don't need to go for outside LPs, but we will do subsequent investments. And those subsequent investments will come from folks that invest in exactly the same way. And you you, you say it really well. Like, I, I'm a repressed Catholic Irish boy, right? So <laughs> I don't have anybody invest in us until I feel that we're, we're safe. And that means that our companies have to be doing very well. And I'm perfectly happy to wait for that. There's there's no rush. I'm not dying anytime soon. So we got time to do this. Um, but I do feel that the small cap aggressive hedge funds of the future will be companies like ours mm -hmm. that have small ownership in hundreds, if not thousands of companies mm -hmm. across the board, but their high growth are high failure companies. Fits into one right. or the other. And failure is part of it. And that's something that as an individual investor going into one company, it's hard to stomach. But we know, and you know, Peter Thiel has pointed out in his book, Zero to One, One Billion, um, that all you need is the one hit. So you can have 20 companies, 19 yep. are failures, and that one major hit will cover... Um, all of the profits for the other 20. And usually there's another, you know, six or seven that are good size returns yeah. on investment, but not the huge. But all you need is one Facebook yeah. in your fund. And I think he had Facebook and Palantir and a couple of others in no, his one fund. Oh, he did fund. very well. Yeah. yeah, he's a smart guy. I mean, there's an element of luck to it, but there's an element of brilliance that yeah. is so close to that yeah. as well. So what will the plat what will your platform look like? Will, they, will the entrepreneurs put videos and they'll put their videos yeah. up on the platform? So they can go look at it right now, radivision.com. Is for radical visionaries. Um, and it's like a Netflix video streaming platform um, and with an Instagram like um, social network that's Beautiful. integrated in since. Our wonderful celebrities aren't household names yet, although that's one of our goals is to make a lot more of these household names. And so it looks like Netflix and Airbnb got married and had a baby named Radivision. <laughs> you know, so we want it to be very user friendly and you know easy and very easy to find all the information in one place. Wonderful. And if you're yeah. gonna list the top four tools that you would get from Radivision. Mm -hmm. As a entrepreneur, putting your content up there or mm -hmm. being engaged or as a normal user who likes watching Shark Tank, what would they be? 
Right. So a normal user can come in and discover, um, you know, new shows and lots of new companies. And, and when you say new shows, mm-hmm. you mean like Silicon Valley type show? Or do um, you mean these are all, entrepreneurs? So all of our shows, we have nine different show concepts that we're out selling right now. Wow. We have one that already tested as a super high hit with uh, Netflix audiences. So it's been introduced into Netflix now. So we're hoping to sign that one. Um, the demographics are, I mean, the data analytics are huge on that. Wow. Um, yeah. So we're excited about that. So that would be uh, 45. Am, this is really ambitious. Oh, yeah. I don't do small things. <laughs> you know, I started the unicorn trend. I've raised a half a billion dollar fund. I <laughs> you, authored my not, own you're legislation. Not, you're you not know, playing. No, no, no. I've, I've influenced about six billion worth of investment in the industry. Beautiful. Um, and this time I'm doing it very consciously. And I want this really to be my legacy. I've loved this industry. I love the passion of entrepreneurs. I actually I think it's gotten harder um, you know now there's more competition everything is very very large uh, everybody wants to have deals de-risked now before they even fund and of course you need to fund it to get to the point of having it de-risked mm-hmm. so there's that initial conundrum situation um, and it, the IPOs are not getting any easier you know in nope. fact they're revisiting the issue because I didn't get to really finish it properly before um, you know the sale was made to second market um, so there's opportunity for improvements and growth there always is through all of life that's what entrepreneurship is right we're here to solve problems in the world so for the viewers they can discover you know new types of content they can discover the companies just like they are on Instagram looking for cool new people and cool new content they can do the same thing with entrepreneurs do they want AI do they want to see what's happening in Lisbon or Buenos Aires everywhere in the world there's amazing entrepreneurs is doing amazing things. So that in itself can be, um, you know, a digital experience. And it's social, so they can interact with them. Yes, we haven't built out all of the social stuff yet. We've been slow on that side and careful because of the privacy issues and all of that. Um, but right now you can share content and um, certainly we can, you know, get companies into contact with um, their viewers who are Wonderful. interested. Like we will have a button that says if you're interested in investing, click here. Right now it's just going to go straight to the companies. The companies can decide what they want to do with it or not. Eventually, there will be new products and new opportunities um, that we hope to offer. And I think a big part of what we'll offer is, you know, the potential to have a single institutional LP that comes from maybe hundreds or thousands of individual investors. So there, there'll be new LP funds supporting more seed VCs, and but it's a way for the little guy to come in in an educated, diversified, protected Very way smart. and have so much fun. Now they, they have a portfolio just like the accredited guys and the institutional guys. Very now smart. everybody can play in this equity economy. But if you look at where the global wealth divide started, it was in the mid to late 90s when the financial market shifted and went to electronic trading and went from the quarter, you know, fractional pricing system into decimalization, the economics left, and then the split came. So those at the top are the people who play in the equity economy, and those at the bottom are still in the industrial revolution. They can't play in the equity economy, and it's created the, you know, economic decline globally. It's created political polarity globally. There's fascism Don't coming in. Don't get me started. In. Don't get me started. Yeah, so this is and really... I, I know like, it's, this, not just, it's, ex, it's all extremism. Like What's yeah. going on in Mexico, for me, is no different mm-hmm. than what people complain about on the right. There's such extremism that's coming in, and it's incredibly hurtful. And it seems like the world is dividing into crazy places. So there is a beautiful purity about entrepreneurship Mm -hmm. that doesn't straddle any of the other things. Because it's not about opinions or right or wrong or good or bad or definitions or criteria. It's about new Mm -hmm. and old and new and improved versus old and needs improvement. Like, that's all. Mm -hmm. So if we had a whole planet of entrepreneurs, and I'll I'll tell you something really, really interesting about our place and what happened in our place um, to, to kind of wrap this all into one area and why what you're doing is so important. We used to source all of our entrepreneurs here in America. And we've invested in 42 companies. 
and I found a couple of things. Number one, the type of folks because entrepreneur because America is very money driven, and um, which means that not that we all like money, which we do, but it's more that the large funds can manipulate the entire market and help mediocre entrepreneurs become unicorns, while amazingly strong entrepreneurs who have phenomenal capacity have got to fail because they're competing against loss making companies that can lose money forever. So. So I won't, I won't start there, but what I do think is that we've gone from being a country of amazingly strong entrepreneurs where we were center of the world, nobody compared to America, to a bunch of weak people who have been tainted by hedonism and weakness because too much money coming into the system. And I say this not with sadness yet. Because we have time to change this. But I'm watching China pass us by. They've gone. They've passed us. Forget about them copying us. They're way past that stage. I'm watching India pass us by. I'm watching Taiwan pass us by. I'm watching South Korea, due to causism, pa pass us by as well. And now, and Israel, of course, have always passed us by because they're awesome, right? And they know exactly what they're doing and they have done for years. But that's okay. They're our friends. So we don't mind that so much. But everybody else is beating us. And we're the best. And we're losing, right? And we're losing because we're getting weaker and because we're not being taught the great standards of fighting through entrepreneurship. So I sound like an old guy, right? But here's my solution, right or wrong for whatever it is. I think we need to rebirth with phenomenal people the same way we did a couple of hundred years ago. I think we need to take folks from outside. We need to do the opposite to what's being suggested that we do right now and take great people. And do actually the same thing Harvard and MIT and all those guys have done for years quietly. Find their best basketball players, their best baseball players. Don't tell anyone. Put them in and hey, presto, they're American tomorrow. Why? Because they're friggin' brilliant and we want them here, not somewhere mm -hmm. else. So I want to do the same thing with entrepreneurship. Now, in our last cohort that we invested in, we brought in... Uh, two German Jews, two Israeli Jews, one Muslim from Turkey, one Protestant from Argentina, one Muslim from Africa, and I am a repressed Catholic <laughs> Irish guy. And we put all these people in one room for three months and they helped each other. And they helped each other because the greater cause of entrepreneurship beats the shit out of all of these small, petty problems that, we are, that are thrust upon us in the world. So I commend what you're doing. I think it's a beautiful thing. The world absolutely needs this. And, and right now, entrepreneurship to many people, 99%, is just a, is a nice... Um, escape that they can watch and they can learn and it shouldn't be that it should become the center of the world and i think you know folks like me are always going to push that but folks like you putting platforms up there where people can engage and learn and become stronger and better and love it is the best thing in the whole world well thank so you thank you for doing that oh, my pleasure can you share with everybody mm -hmm. details how they find you mm -hmm. before we jump and I want to leave it, especially with somebody with your phenomenal experience in this space, by painting us a picture of a better world, which is just full of entrepreneurs. Okay, so contact details, yeah. website details, and then leave us with that vision. Yeah, so they can go to radivision.com, R-A-D-I for radical, and then vision for visionaries.com. And you will see our original shows, our aggregated content. You can click on profile pages. You can join as a member. And uh, if you're an entrepreneur, you can create your own uh, person profile page. You can create your company profile page. And you can start uploading your own content, so like your podcasts and your events. And um, you can even create social posts, just like you would on Facebook or on Instagram. And um, start watching and share it and like it and um, let people know about it. And then you can also vote on who our next celebrities will be that we will film for our Driven show, which is One Ride Problem Solved. It's a mentoring session in the back of a car. Mm. Um, and you can, if you have any questions or need me, I'm Mona at Radivision.com. Um, we are going out into the market with a pretty polished product now after three years of development. Beautiful. This is our 3.0. But we um, want more and more user feedback. So um, 
we're reaching out to accelerators. You know, we're we have nine shows in development. We're in conversations with a lot of the big media distributors. So hopefully you'll be seeing our shows on Netflix and who knows, maybe Disney Plus, maybe Apple. We'll see where the others go. Um, and they're also on Facebook. They're on YouTube. Um, Instagram, so you can find Radivision. You can also look for our shows, uh, The Visionaries. Um, and that one, all of the new companies coming in will be able to create their own episode. So Wonderful. I'd love to see your episode, I'll be Brian. there. You know I'll be there. Now, yeah. pay me this picture. I want to leave. Okay. I got 30 years from you. <laughs> Maybe an extra one or two on top of that as well. I got yeah. four IPOs. I've got God knows how many entrepreneurs you've gone through. I've got six billion dollars in total raises. Yeah. I want you to share me a vision of the world in yeah. ten years' time, which is dominated. Yeah. So this I is, say dominated, not like contributed yeah. by, but no. dominated by entrepreneurs. No, I mean look, we're in the entrepreneurial revolution. This isn't the agricultural revolution anymore, you know. This is not the industrial revolution. We are in the entrepreneurial revolution. It is the future economy, and it's all about the equity economy. And it doesn't mean that everybody has to be an entrepreneur. It is really Really hard. It requires a lot of resilience and risk-taking profile. But if you understand how equity works, you can be um, an uh, an employee, also getting in on this equity economy and doing very well with your stock options, better than you're able to now because it's very complex and hard to understand. You can also be investing part of your 401k plan and your IRA in this. This is what the SEC wants you to do. They want you to be able to invest part of that in illiquid securities. So you get these highest returns. So really, everybody in the world will be involved in this new economy, not just the top 1% who is sophisticated and can do it and now is growing their wealth faster than ever in history and um, in, in a very small corner. We want equitable distribution of of this um, opportunity. We want tremendous prosperity. But the most important thing is entrepreneurs do what they do by fixing problems. We find a problem, we create a solution, and that delivers so much value in the world, and that's why so much value comes back to the companies. But the future is going to be, we're fixing global warming. That's um, We're starting to do editorial specials on the platform. So we start with Sheikonomics in March, highlighting all these studies on women entrepreneurs, and then we're doing a special editorial on global warming and climate change. Wonderful. There are companies out there pulling carbon out of the air right now and they're selling it to Coca-Cola as an economic thing. Yes. So we're really seeing... Um, you know, social enterprise, like where the, you know, you're going after the economics, but you're creating a tremendous social impact. Like we're building a very real company with Radivision, but it's going to have a huge social impact, you know, humanitarian impact that'll create prosperity for all and help shrink the global wealth divide while helping that 90% failure rate hopefully go to at least a 50% success rate. I'm so the you. more we support entrepreneurship, the fewer problems we're going to have in the world, you know, because we'll be finding more and more solutions and we'll be able to get to the more critical you know, uh, issues that we have out there. There's nothing that cannot be fixed. So don't be a klutz. Yeah. <laughs> Join the revolution. <laughs> Mona, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for joining oh, the show. it's been my pleasure. I'm honored. Thank you all. And that's a wrap. Thanks for joining us. If you love the podcast, please empower your circle by sharing these stories. The Art of Startup War is brought to you by Expert Dojo. And remember, we invest in startups. $50,000 checks. Make sure you apply on our site if you are one of those great entrepreneurs looking to bring your company to the next level. As far as the Art of Startup War is concerned, we are back every single Tuesday at 10 a.m. So remember, check out the new episodes. If you want to find out what the investors think, check out season one or two. But make sure you join us every single week.